thanks very much for for uh, coming to the summit. Uh, yesterday we had a fantastic day, um, and we we're about to have a, a another great day today. Uh, so reflecting on on yesterday, um, we had a number of fantastic talks, uh, really talking about kind of the the present of pinning services and what groups are doing and what they're thinking of doing and in, in, in which directions to head. And uh, what today is about, uh, we talked a bit about uh, making this about the future um, and thinking about the opportunities that are going to come for services during 2020 and potentially 2021. Um, a number of these are related. Uh, and so some of the things that uh, that I'm going to cover now in this um, in the in this talk uh, are kind of setting up the the other talks. So um, I'm going to uh, motivate a little bit the, the need for uh, pinning APIs and then um, uh, we'll we'll hear more about kind of uh, how those might be integrated into applications, and then and then we'll also see hear about um, uh, potential Falcon integrations and PowerGate. Great. So quick motivation on on why uh, why there's uh, interesting opportunities at the moment. So uh, first off, 2020 and 2021 is is kind of a critical period. There are lots of key applications and projects being built, um, and and just improving the ecosystem as a whole. So this this means um, all kinds of developer tools are, are arriving that are that are transforming how um, applications and users of IPFS um, uh, end up using the system. So, so this means that in this time period, um, as new developer tools are being made um, or new systems uh, that are built either under IPFS or over IPFS, so things like Libp2P improving or um, uh, things like Falcon and so on, um, all of these developer tools and systems uh, coming uh, are changing the nature of how people store data and move data with IPFS. Uh, and so it's a it's a pretty interesting time for infrastructure providers in in the IPFS ecosystem because it means that there's there's more opportunities. The product landscape is changing, um, and and there's there, suddenly things that weren't possible before are now possible, or suddenly new new um, capabilities are, are are unlocked for for infrastructure providers. And so this is um, you can think of it as, as uh, for example, noting the, the release of things like buckets from Textile, where um, now we can uh, we can see that those kinds of things getting integrated into into other services. Um, so we, we heard uh, the, the announcements yesterday about about integrations into into um, uh, some applications. But this is something that many pending services could do, right? So many pending services could, could now offer uh, replication replication over buckets. Uh, that's just one example. There are a lot of different kinds of primitives emerging in the ecosystem that, that'll improve how um, how people use use IPFS. Uh, the second reason is that the ecosystem is growing very fast right now. So there's uh, a lot of momentum, a lot of applications being built, a lot of groups uh, coming, and so that means that all of those application bu builders um, uh, who are you know primarily interested in building their their apps um, can would would love to be able to use uh, just reliable infrastructure that they can count on. To not have to um, not not have to figure out a lot of stuff themselves, meaning um, they might want to do things like replicate their 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 pins or make them available in certain regions of the world and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, and just having services that are that are really high quality that they can they can rely on um, supports that ecosystem growth and then kind of helps accel accelerate it. Um, one important point here is that the the apps that you support dr drive your success. So as, as infrastructure providers. Um, your success is, is kind of defined by the applications you support. And similarly, the success of those applications and the services that you're making drive the success of the project and of the community. So you can think of um, all of the IPFS community as super aligned with, with your success. Um, and, and the more that, that you succeed as a service provider, um, the more the project succeeds. So uh, we all want you to build really successful businesses, and, and we want you to support great applications. And that means that. Um, the people contributing to to IPFS and so on want to help you um, be as successful as you can be. So there's all kinds of things like um, building better features to the tools, or building new kinds of things, or identifying opportunities that, that you might be going after that could be could turn into a, a successful a successful um, opportunity. Uh, one interesting note here is because this is a, an ecosystem undergoing a lot of growth, um, and because IPFS is still very very um, new, like relative to the mainstream, right? So um, we still have not yet crossed the chasm to the to the broader mainstream mainstream world. There's a just a huge market um, uh, available for adoption. Uh, it means that there there isn't that much competition. Meaning, um, 
the the ecosystem is expanding, and so all parties working together to to expand uh, the uh, how IPFS uh, works and its use and so on um, will just be a much better strategy and more successful thing than than kind of competing com uh, competing internally. And and we've seen this a lot of a lot of uh, of the infrastructure providers in in the IPFS ecosystem uh, help each other, have calls, are super collaborative, um, share uh, lessons, share code, and all that kind of stuff because um, the 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 uh, services are, are actually differentiated enough uh, across a, a number of dimensions that that and, and the ecosystem is growing such that the, there's not yet like a like an intense competition uh, world. Um, the the last thing um, that I wanted to to wrap into into today was that um, I frequently get asked how Falcon will fit into the picture and how pinning services can participate in in that um, in that ecosystem. And how Falcon and IPFS will interop, and, and so on. So I wanted to create an opportunity today to to discuss some of that and and wrap some of the opportunities that can can come out of that um, along these other ones that are kind of IPFS specific. Uh, great. So so with that, um, let's let's dive in. Um, I kind of broke broke it apart into three three different sections. Um, number one is use case specialization. Number two is expanding product offerings, and three three is Falcon. And I'm going to be sprinkling recommendations along the way, so I'm not, not going to have kind of like a recommendation section at the end. I'll rather kind of be mentioning mentioning rec recommendations here and there. So, for use case specialization, um, we talked a little bit about this yesterday, uh, but there's a number of different different kinds of use cases that um, that IPFS is really can be really good for. Either it's, it's already good for or is very close to being good for, um, and we think, or I, I think that pinning services and infra infrastructure providers will end up creating a much better product and actually get a significant user base by thinking carefully about those use cases and working against them. Meaning, um, understanding how the users of those use cases uh, actually are trying to to use IPFS and what. Um, what they need from from their infrastructure providers. So, for example, uh, somebody making a Web3 application, um, their needs are, are going to be very different than somebody trying to to publish or distribute video. Um, and so, thinking about those use cases and and thinking about how how your APIs or or your performance has to change to match those needs um, will help you uh, target like these different different kinds of markets. Um, so let's dive into into some examples. So, um, you know, we we Talked about Web Web three app data uh, before, so so this includes um, all of the front ends of applications or or the actual um, user generated data within them. So think of um, in in Audius here as the example. Think of the playlists, the the records about the songs, the play the views, and all that kind of stuff. Um, so all of that data is is structured as as uh, as um, in a way that you can now replicate directly in a pinning service, and this is for the most part the majority of the of the pinning service focuses around this. Um, another another example of this is um, uh, pretty pretty similar, but you can think of of Web3 DApps that are primarily just a, a a very light front end around some some Ethereum smart contract or, or some other contract in another another blockchain where you want a, a smooth user experience and so you give people um, a, a UI associated with the contract, but that UI is is um, viewable in the browser, loaded over IPFS and then making um, making calls directly to to Ethereum through MetaMask or something like that. Um, and kind of the common the common path right now is is um, people using a pinning service, which eventually kind of backs up to to some regular cloud like AWS and so on. And um, a lot of these folks, uh, these DAP um, creators, would prefer to get their their data stored in a blockchain because um, it's kind of critical to to their contracts to have the whole thing fully decentralized. Um, and so a lot of the ecosystem growth that we're seeing is in the Web3 space. So this is kind of like a well well trodden use case. I think uh, we're covering this one this one pretty well. There's probably still uh, things to improve there, but but overall, this this is well done. Uh, some of the stuff that I think um, we haven't focused on that much, but I, but I think are present really good opportunities for for um, pinning services are things like developer assets. So think of um, how might we um, how might we store and replicate all kinds of developer assets for um, use in in the production of software, um, uh, and and tune the pinning service to be able to back up 
all of that kind of stuff. Today, people tend to use GitHub for a number of things um, and tend to use some package manager registries and so on. But there's also a lot of stuff that doesn't um, can't easily go on there or where um, using IPFS in conjunction with those things can can improve things. So we we've heard about the example from um, from kind of using using IPFS to move around Docker containers and, and speeding up the distribution at data center. So all of those use cases are going to need some tooling improvement and some performance improvements uh, to really flesh them out. And, and this is where having infrastructure providers that are focused on these use cases will, will help um, understand them uh, very well and be able to, to help the people building applications on this um, actually have a, a really good, good experience. Um, and, and yeah, we, I, I'm going to uh, suggest also uh, things like bots are are a good uh, good example for infra infrastructure providers where you can run run a bot that that uh, can will do some some um, processing or pinning or something and those bots can be tightly integrated with with some platform like GitHub or GitLab or Slack or things like that. Um, when we think about developer assets, uh, think of like all of the various different static assets that you might not um, push into into Git. Um, think of think of all the binaries and, and the builds, the intermediate uh, kind of artifacts that are created. Think of packages, think of containers, think of VMs. All of that kind of stuff and being able to distribute it with with IPFS uh, would be really really sweet. Um, but it but again it does need some some kind of um, infrastructure tooling to to improve. Then there's things like um, thinking about CI and CD pipelines where uh, all of the logs of a CI CD service could be could be um, moved moved this way or archived uh, in IPFS. Uh, and then there are things like integrations with with larger data tools. So um, a lot of software uh, ends up involving um, large data pipelines. And in those cases, a lot of the traditional tools or things like Git just don't work. Um, and so you would like to be able to version uh, version control a lot of um, a lot of these larger pieces of data and back them up somewhere. Um, but but that kind of tooling is not not very well fleshed out. Things like Git LFS and others exist, but but they they don't fit a bunch of those use, use cases that well. All right, moving on to video. So um, uh, a pending service uh, oriented towards towards video would would probably switch, um, would probably require a different set of performance guarantees. So we probably have uh, much higher bandwidth usage and would have to focus on very low latency delivery of the first few uh, first few bytes. Um, uh, and then kind of after that, um, just making sure that there's kind of like a reliable stream and and, and so on. And, and that might might just look a, a bit different than than some of the other use cases. Uh, also, this might just be a lot of data. So most of the pinning services that that uh, uh, that I know about are are not yet storing large quantities of video. Um, and the moment that uh, an application is is considering storing large quantities of video, um, then price becomes a, a really big deal. And so it's a it's a possibility there that um, focusing on the use, this use case would require kind of thinking about the cost model in a different way. Uh, streaming is a particularly interesting use case where. Um, Thinking of infrastructure for streams um, is a whole different different ballgame as well. When you think about live video and transcoding and and uh, storing all these intermediate artifact, artifacts and serving them, um, that might be interesting. But also it could be relaying. Um, so if there's a kind of a peer to peer stream um, uh, of people watching watching some video, uh, having being able to kind of um, hire uh, relayers of of all this traffic. Uh, that could be a, a very interesting, interesting um, uh, uh, infrastructure opportunity. Uh, then there, are, there are things like uh, large data sets, things like um, public data sets, um, uh, you know, large enterprise data, and so on. A lot of these use cases look very similar, um, and they're they're not um, they're not that hard to do with the tooling that IPFS already has. But there there is kind of a sophisticated um, set of constraints for when um, for, for the different kinds of domains. So, for example, machine learning um, orients around certain kinds of data sets with certain kinds of sizes and so on, uh, which might be very different from biology. And so, there, there might be some some kind of um, even within this use case, kind of some uh, some like sub use cases to think about, um, and different users and different different experiences required to to kind of like give a really compelling compelling experience. Uh, one of the things that, that I've been thinking about. Uh, Alongside this is that um, perhaps a really really good way to to connect um, the work that we're uh, th that we're doing in IPFS with all the archive stuff and in, in 
uh, Falcon with a with uh, Falcon Discover, which which launched yesterday. You'll you'll get to there's a lightning talk later today about it. Um, would be to to um, just create bounties for finding really good valuable data sets that people want on on IPFS, and then um, just funding the the as a bounty funding the the backing up of it to a pending service. So imagine um, we figure out some some data sets, we figure out what it what it would cost to pin them on 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 one of the pinning services, and then we just put a bounty out for for actually processing that data set and putting it into the pinning service for for say six months or twelve months or something like that. And um, uh, yeah, so I'm I'm very lucky gonna do this. So so if um, uh, you're interested in this kind of problem or you've been wanting to kind of hunt hunt for some data sets and add them to IPFS, um, definitely uh, come talk to me. Uh, we talked yesterday a bit about games and game distribution platforms. Uh, this is another use case that I think uh, is is kind of ripe. Um, there's still a lot of of tooling that that might need to get built built out for for different components. Um, but we're, but we're now at the point where where distributing game assets um, uh, could be done much faster much faster with IPFS, especially thinking about all the different kind of band, bandwidth utilization that you can get um, in kind of the the same kind of peer to peer BitTorrent sort of way. Um, you know, uh, in in the old days, Blizzard used to use uh, BitTorrent to distribute patches and and large uh, large software updates. I'm not sure if they still do, um, but it certainly is extremely difficult to to use a lot of that tooling if you're not familiar with it. Uh, something like IPFS can make this dramatically easier and and, and better. Um, but this is going to require some some thinking about the whole distribution of flow. Um, think think of a bit of, a bit of it uh, like a package manager, but um, uh, the, if people are interested in games and, and IPFS, uh, and this might be like a very interesting direction to head because th these kinds of use cases generate a huge amount of data. And so for, for a pinning service that kind of specializes in this direction, um, they might find like a, a very large, large market there. Uh, it might require a, a larger lift in terms, terms of developer tooling, um, but this would be potentially really interesting. Um, there are a number of um, companies around the blockchain space Already building very high quality games, and and I think that they they are still kind of um, building in normal Web two uh, oriented pathways because they don't know that they can rely on on kind of infrastructure providers to to sort out their data needs. So this this I think is a is a pretty interesting uh, opportunity. I think um, potentially two very good use case um, use cases to to start with would be decentraland and crypto voxels. If um, if a pending service wants to go and back up all of their data. Um, and kind of do a bit of the work with them to to figure out how to structure it, how to back it up, uh, how to pin it, and so on. Um, then then uh, it would start proving out the use case, and then maybe some blog posts after that. Um, a lot more games might start doing this. Uh, another interesting thing that that we've seen is that there are um, th there are a number of browsers that are that are starting to add. IPFS support, but in some cases, especially in mobile, uh, they're opting to start with using a gateway for for resolution instead of putting a node in the in the browser itself. Um, this is partly for resource requirements and so on, which makes a lot of sense. Um, in this case, um, we've we've heard that it would be extremely useful to be able to have infrastructure providers that can just run these gateways for them uh, and are experienced in, in in doing so and can run them with extremely high availability. So this is, I think, a, an extremely useful. Um, Opportunity for for folks that are interested in that that kind of service. All right, so that's that's it for for the use case specialization seg segment. There's of course more more use cases, but um, this is just kind of a flavor of of how um, a pinning service might might kind of orient in one direction and go after a specific kind of um, submarket and 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 uh, help out there. Uh, I do think that right now a lot of there's a lot of latent interest. But those groups can't use the tooling that's there yet, and so there's a little bit of bridging to do there, and then that would unlock a lot of a lot of data that I use. So right. Um, so in terms of expanding um, kind of the product offering, so that, so this is a, still kind of a very general use case, and less about pinning data and more about doing other kinds of things in in IPFS. Um, so this might include things like managed nodes, like being able to easily deploy uh, networks of nodes, uh, doing all of the Different kind of like multi-region support if somebody wants to have a nodes in, in a bunch of different uh, regions in the world. Uh, figuring out all the metrics and then analytics to be able to present all of that stuff to to, um, to users really well. 
Uh, similar to this, being able to deploy private networks where people want to maintain um, a completely separate network uh, and run an application in, in a separate way. I think that, that is a particular use case that a number of groups is, is interested in. And so far, those groups have had to do it all for themselves. So they haven't been able to, to work with an infrastructure provider that did that. And so I think that this is an opportunity for, for some applications that want to head in that direction. Um, and this would require some knowledge around how to do the network isolation, how to, how to uh, set the, the, the private um, network key and so on, uh, and also how to run the different pieces that are needed to make the network work, which means bootstrappers, gate, potentially gateways, um, relays, and so on. Uh, you could also go in the direction of setting up traffic relays. Uh, there's a lot of nodes in the network that are behind extremely um, aggressive NATs and firewalls, and getting to those is, is, is fairly hard. The best strategy around this is relays. Um, we don't relay traffic by default inside of IPFS because that would be like a, like a pretty bad bandwidth usage for, uh, for users. But this is something that could become a service, right? And so um, we could totally see uh, services springing up where a user of IPFS hires the traffic relay as a service and just moves all of their traffic um, through and, and kind of exposes a, a, public, uh, a public address. Uh, similar to that, there's um, kind of a, a, a need for better stats and analytics um, around how the network is operating. So if somebody has a lot of content and they want it to be to be routable, actually understanding how well distributed over the network it is and, and so on uh, is a, a useful set of features. So um, parties that have a lot of data and want to make a lot of data available um, might opt to, to use services that, that provide a really high quality um, experience here. Uh, then there's also uh, think, thinking about um, developer tooling for IPFS developers specifically, which means um, think of CI and CD pipelines in a peer-to-peer -peer that, that deal with all the peer-to-peer -peer, uh, uh, stuff that, that might be different. So things like configuring the network in a specific way, either connecting to um, private networks that are isolated or connecting to the public network to run run tests, um, being able to to have like a a we, we just uh, released test ground as a as a project and and that project uh is this large scale um peer-to-peer -peer lab uh kind of kind of software uh a lot of groups uh have mentioned that they would be interested in running it and using it um this is an opportunity for an infrastructure provider that would just like to uh wrap this up in kind of like a one-click deploy for for a whole set of test suites um, that's some stuff that we we don't have bandwidth to to work on, but it's it's totally available and TestGround is, is is fully open source, so anybody can 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 do this. Um, I think that's that's kind of a a, a small business like Travis um, setting there to uh, for somebody to create. Uh, I think everywhere across the stack, a a, a stronger focus on analytics and metrics and, and visualizing of the, of this um, would be extremely useful as a as a differentiator. Um, a lot of people want to be able to, to, to know what's going on in, in their nodes, uh, and especially in some cases, being able to get alerts when certain kinds of things happen. So certain kinds of conditions on the network um, causing uh, some kind of behavior, uh, people would like to be able to, uh, to be alerted on those, in those cases. Uh, and then, then, of course, there's, there's uh, all kinds of data processing that people um, want to do uh, before pinning. So this, this starts looking into looking like how to import certain ki kinds of files or, or data sets, um, integrations to, to other data processing tools and systems. Um, there's a ton of things out there that, uh, that, that are in, in different domains of, of data science and being able to kind of integrate with those toolings um, is something that, that might make a, a pinning service a, a much more useful service. Um, being able to do, do, to do the, the kind of computation that that um, so th there's a way of using IPFS where you can start thinking of the of the code um, of, of the data as code and think of running transformations over over um, the IPLD graphs. So being able to have a a, a mo model where you could do things like MapReduce over IPFS or um, or things of that nature uh, that might be an, a a really interesting platform. And so that starts starts moving away from from getting services and starts going into kind of um, kind of lambda style uh, computing and so on. Um, but it might be like a, a, a pretty interesting in, interesting service. Um, and related to that, there's there's a ton of uh, need lately in, in the machine learning community for 
for data processing pipelines, especially um, ones that take into account, um, you know, artifact memoization, where where you're doing these super expensive computations, and you would like to not rerun them again if you, if you can. And content addressing gives you the ability ability to do this. So so there's um, there's a few services out there called uh, that are trying to do this. Um, IPFS could be an extremely extremely useful addition to this, um, and and so that's something that a pinning service might might opt to go. Uh, another part of this is is uh, starting to explore different kinds of access controls. So right now, most most of the pinning services work in a way that um, just pinning something tends to mean anybody can can view it. Um, a number of users want to do to provide different kinds of access controls where um, maybe they just want to want to pin it for their own use or maybe they want to publish it and serve it to a subset of users but but not pay for the traffic um, from everybody or the content is encrypted but they really need the content to be decrypted in a gateway so so kind of having the decrypting gateways that um, that have been experimented with I think textile and others have have uh, have made these um, being able to kind of have that that as a service is something that uh, uh, that some groups might might want. Uh, and we talked about collaborative pins a bit yesterday, but um, it strikes me that this is one this is one thing that um, that a lot of groups in mainstream data science would really care about. There's there's a lot of very large data sets where people would love to be able to share the costs of of storing and distributing these because they don't. Um, uh, and, and in a lot of cases, uh, just kind of having community funded um, registries of of data. Would be would be an extremely useful useful thing to do, and so this starts veering away from 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 just broad pinning, uh, and starts starts turning into kind of like a GitHub for for data. Um, this is something that the, the number of groups have have talked about over the years as, as wanting. Um, but what's really missing is is a a group that can shoulder like the the very large quantities of data uh, involved. You know, data sets with many terabytes in size each, um, and then be able to kind of do all of the all of the Hard um, file distribution work to to, uh, to to make it all work. All right. So the the third you know category of of um, uh, of opportunities is around Falcoin. And for that, I, I asked Pooja to uh, to give a, a an intro to to Falcoin for us. And so I'm gonna hand off to Pooja um, in a moment, and then then I'll uh, I'll pick back up uh, and go from there. Pooja, are you ready? Awesome. So hi, everyone. Um, I'm really excited to be here talking about Filecoin at the IPFS Pinning Summit. I think there's some really awesome integration opportunities. Um, and so I wanted to start a little bit by setting the stage for um, what sorts of use cases that Filecoin is aiming to solve. Um, and then Juan, I think, is going to tie it together and see how Filecoin fits into this larger ecosystem. And then we'll dive into some more like concrete opportunities for how to integrate Filecoin into pinning services and other service providers um, over the next few months. So um, I'm not sure how many of you have been following the Filecoin roadmap very closely, but we're about to launch mainnet in just a couple months. And already the Filecoin ecosystem is vibrant and thriving. There are tons of opportunities across the stack um, at the research layer. There are opportunities for application developers, service providers, which, which is probably what's most relevant to our conversation today. Um, and really for anyone who cares about efficiently priced, geographically distributed storage. So I'd like to start by talking about why Filecoin exists. What problems are we trying to solve? And which use cases do we want to enable? Um, I'd like to focus in especially on some of the core features in Filecoin that make these use cases even stronger. Um, and then I'll touch on where we are as a project, community, and ecosystem and then hand it back to Juan. Filecoin's mission is to create a decentralized, efficient, and robust foundation for humanity's information. Over the past several decades, we've seen numerous examples of how centralized storage infrastructures can sometimes be brittle and untrustworthy solutions for storing humanity's most valuable resource, which is information. Filecoin aims to be um, this resilient and trustworthy foundation for all of humanity's knowledge. And we're getting there by solving a few key problems that exist with centralized storage infrastructure today. So first, Filecoin is a decentralized cloud. Filecoin creates a marketplace where storage clients and providers can interact directly. And thus, Filecoin eliminates the reliance on, reliance on a few centralized cloud storage providers and instead creates a decentralized cloud. 
Filecoin users retain full control over their data. So you get to make your own decisions on what happens to the data that you store on the Filecoin network. Filecoin's an efficient storage market. Users on the network get to set the prices that they're willing to pay and accept for storage. So instead of having to pay the prices that are set by corporate pricing departments, users have the freedom to enter into economic contracts that are most affordable for them. One thing that's really unique about Filecoin is this feature of verifiable storage. So Filecoin requires that storage providers um, repeatedly generate cryptographic proofs of storage to verify that when they say that they're storing your data, they actually are. These verifiable tamper-proof cryptographic proofs enable Filecoin to actually work as a decentralized protocol that also has data storage guarantees. So you no longer need to trust an intermediary organization to know that your data is being stored safely. It's a core feature that is enabled by the protocol. And lastly, Filecoin puts the zettabytes of idle storage capacity that exists in the world to work. There, there are massive amounts of storage capacity that are sitting around unused in data centers, basements, and hard drives all over the world. And this amount of data is growing every single day. Filecoin's a marketplace that allows this storage capacity to be hired by customers, creating efficient use for an otherwise underutilized asset. The Filecoin protocol <clears throat> embeds a number of features to solve these problems and to ultimately move towards this mission of creating a decentralized, efficient, and robust foundation uh, and storage layer for humanity's information. And although the network and ecosystem are still very early, we've already seen Filecoin start to generate positive impact on a number of really important use cases. And that's what I'd like to talk about next. One example is our work with the Shoah Foundation. For the last year, we've been working with USC's Shoah Foundation to store the world's largest genocide testimonial archive on the Filecoin network. There are people in the world today who deny that certain atrocities and genocides like the Holocaust were ever committed. The Shoah Foundation's mission is to develop empathy, understanding, and respect by sharing these stories of testimony more broadly. The Visual History Archive, as it's called, includes testimony from more than 55,000 survivors across nine genocides in 62 countries. And it's more than nine petabytes worth of recordings that will ultimately be stored on the Filecoin mainnet. Some of this data is already being stored on a Filecoin testnet. The, the Show Foundation chose to work with Filecoin because of our use of these uh, tamper-proof cryptographic proofs of storage. Filecoin's proofs allow users to trust that the videos that they're viewing haven't been tampered with, that they're the original truth. Another example comes from our work collaborating with a number of scientific and cultural institutions to store valuable, massive data sets on Filecoin. It's kind of staggering, but I recently learned that we Store, we generate more than two and a half quintillion bytes of data every single day. For context, this is something like more than 2,000 shipping containers full of 870 megabyte CD-ROMs. Um, it includes 294 billion emails, 64 billion WhatsApp messages, 500 million tweets, but it also includes useful scientific data such as climate science reports, disease tracking maps, connected car coordinates, and more. While much of this data is stored and preserved, it's also the case that millions of gigabytes worth of useful scientific data and other types of data are routinely discarded every day. And at Filecoin, we believe that this is a lost opportunity for our society. Um, if stored and analyzed, these data could yield really precious you know, and priceless research and discoveries. We want Filecoin to be the home for this sort of important information. So over the last few months, and Juan alluded to this earlier, we've been working with several institutions to preserve open access data. We've already begun onboarding petabytes worth of data onto the Filecoin testnet, and we have a pipeline for hundreds of petabytes of data to follow on the Filecoin mainnet. We just announced this project called Filecoin Discover yesterday on the Filecoin blog, and we'll have someone doing a lightning talk on this project as well um, later today. The last example that I want to highlight comes from storing Web3 app and user data on Filecoin. And again, Juan touched on this a little bit earlier. Um, but I wanted to talk specifically about the Filecoin angle um, in this use case. So Filecoin, we think, is an especially good solution for DAP projects um, in the IPFS ecosystem and more broadly. Most Web3 applications today split their storage across a number of solutions. Uh, for example, Web3 photo sharing applications, and I've grabbed uh, an example from textile photos here. They store their business logic on networks like Ethereum, their front-end applications on IPFS, 
and their user data either on IPFS or a Web2 service provider like Amazon Web Services. The idea is that with Filecoin, these types of applications can store all of the relevant data directly on the Filecoin network, a crypto native Web3 solution. Direct bridges from smart contract platforms to Filecoin are also already in the works, and this should make DAP data storage on Filecoin even more seamless in the near term. Seeing this type of real world impact of the Filecoin project is especially motiva motivating for me, and I am personally just so excited to find more of these use cases and see ways that Filecoin can uniquely serve them. Um, but even with some of these early use cases, I can already start to see this future where Filecoin is really going to change the way that we interact with data um, just day to day. The Filecoin community is kind of in a Cambrian explosion period right now. We finally got all of the core protocol and research development work done, um, and we're starting to see real businesses and applications and powerful user experiences being built on the network. So this is the next part of the discussion that I'd like to get to. Where, where's Filecoin today as a project, community, and ecosystem? As I mentioned earlier, the core tools and building blocks are now in place, and so we're starting to see lots of activity with developers, miners, and storage clients or other types of users. The Filecoin project has active development across 200 repos, including node implementations, Filecoin proofs, developer tooling and APIs, and also many community products and applications. Since launching our first development networks in early 2019, we've seen our open source developer community grow from around 20 active contributors to more than 1,200 uh, total cumulative contributors today. And again, the, the network is still pre-launch, so I think we just have a really awesome developer community, which is really great for all of these new applications and services that we are starting to see and hope to see over the next uh, several years. There are currently four Filecoin node implementations that are placing the finishing touches on their implementations. These are Go Filecoin, Lotus, Forest, and Fuhan, and they're written in Go, Rust, and C++. At the Web3 Summit last year, we launched the Filecoin Dev Grants Program to provide some light ecosystem support to communities uh, to teams that were building applications and tooling on Filecoin. And to date, we've run three waves of the Dev Grants program, awarding around 45 grants and a uh, total one and a half million dollars to teams within the ecosystem. We're currently accepting applications actually for Dev Grants Wave 4, and you can learn more about the program on the website. We launched the first feature complete Filecoin testnet in December 2019. And this has been really exciting. Since, since you know, just a few months ago, we've seen this network grow from zero petabytes to almost five petabytes of storage on the network. And there's almost 35 petabytes of storage that's waiting to join the network. Um, there are also hundreds of miners that are actively participating every day on the Filecoin testnet. And this is really interesting because, you know, these are serious organizations with significant funding and resources. Their whole, you know, businesses that are already starting to be built on the mining side on Filecoin. Um, and these teams are really committing hard. So we've seen actually in total something like, I think, thousands of active miners that have participated on the testing over the last few months. This is not an incentivized network. So all of this energy leads us to have strong expectations that the network is going to grow by several orders of magnitude in size when we actually launch the mainnet. In general, we've seen a tremendous amount of enthusiasm within the Filecoin mining community. Some miners have started to announce on you know, places like Twitter pretty publicly that they have exabytes of storage capacity that are waiting to join for mainnet launch. Filecoin meetups continue to take place around the world weekly. And there are also miners that have posted videos of racks of storage space that are ready to go for a Filecoin launch. Uh, there's a video here. I'll skip playing it today, but we can uh, share out the slides. It's like a really fun video to watch. Um, as someone who works more on the product side, I'm currently most excited by all of the developer tooling and applications that have started to build on the Filecoin ecosystem. And building on Filecoin is now easier than ever. We have comprehensive documentation, there are numerous API libraries, dev development oriented test networks, hosted nodes, and all sorts of other developer infrastructure that are necessary to easily build on Filecoin. Several teams have already started using this developer platform to build community friendly tooling. Um, so some examples of this are block explorers by teams like IPFS Force, IPFS Union, and DTEC. There's a self-hosted web wallet that was actually built by Open Work Labs, and Jonathan from Open Work Labs gave a, a talk and I think a demo of this yesterday. Um, also other wallets, uh, mobile, it's a mobile wallet by a community team as well. I think, I believe it's IPFS Force. 
This is a chain visualizer built by AE Studio. And um, this is kind of a preview of a dashboard that's going to be built for mining nodes built by a team called Node Factory. Um, this, this is a product I'm actually really excited about, and you're going to hear a lot more about it today. Um, Andrew from Textile presented on, on threads yesterday, and he's going to be presenting with Aaron from the Textile team on PowerGate specifically. Um, but Textile is a team that we've all heard about a lot. They've just done incredible work in the IPFS and Filecoin ecosystems over the last few years. And more recently, they've been building a suite of tools to make development on Filecoin seamless and intuitive. Textile's PowerGate is an easy to use interface to store and retrieve data from Filecoin. And it also exposes a really um, intuitive developer API. And there's a very interesting use case for pinning services um, directly, which I think a number of us will talk about in, in other talks as well. Um, and this one is also interesting. We're, we're also building a Filecoin GUI that will enable a broader set of users to engage with Filecoin using familiar user interfaces like Dropbox and um, Google Drive type of storage experiences. We've learned obviously that you know, Web3 products can actually be really intimidating to users who are new to the space. So this is our attempt to lower that barrier to entry um, and inspire delight in some of our early Filecoin users. I think we're also going to give a lightning talk on this one later today. Um, but this product is also interesting. And I think there's some, some cool opportunities for pinning services to leverage these, these types of GUIs as dashboards um, to expose to their users that choose to use Filecoin storage. All of these products and many more are going to be live within the next few months. And just a reminder that, you know, while the Filecoin ecosystem is vibrant and growing, this is just the beginning. And especially within the world of pinning services and other uh, infrastructure that ties into Filecoin, it's so early. There's so many opportunities. This space is super wide open. Um, and we're really excited to start working with mission aligned developers who are looking to join the ecosystem and start building now. And that's all. Thank you for that introduction. Um, so later today, we're going we're gonna to go into exploring the kinds of integrations that are possible. Um, there's another time slot uh, dedicated to kind of going in detail into um, what refuel mining is, uh, how it works, how you might pin to and from Filecoin. So if you're an IPFS pinning service, how you might um, either use Filecoin underneath the hood or reverse get deals from Filecoin and, and, uh, and pin for the Filecoin network. Um, and then, and we'll see other kinds of kinds of ways of integrating. Um, what I wanted to do with the, the remaining remaining time here um, was kind of talk a little bit about the the characteristics of storage mining and retrieval mining in Falcoin um, as they relate to uh, pinning services in terms of kind of the the um, the, the space of um, uh, the space of possibility. And and kind of what what I mean is. Um, looking at, at these kinds of graphs, where um, understanding what the uh, what, what the kind of characteristics of those parties in the network um, are, uh, really has like this amazing overlap with what pinning services do today, um, and so that means that being those parties is is potentially like a a, a, um, a strong business opportunity for for U.S. pinning services. Um, so, kind of on the on the as an example. Uh, on the left side is kind of like a, a graph of uh, cost of storage uh, over time uh, graphed against retrieval latency uh, of data. And so this is kind of like a, a normal way of, of, um, uh, of representing this where, where you can see things like Glacier and S3 uh, mapped out there. And so the, those are actually quite wide because uh, Glacier, for example, has different, different um, feature levels. And so certain kinds of paying at certain kinds of, uh, of levels um, can get you, uh, you, you still pay the same amount for, for storing in the long term, but, but you pay a different amount for retrieval um, and you end up uh, getting it in different, very different time scales. So, uh, you know, as low as a few minutes to as high as many hours. Uh, S3 is a lot more, more narrow and kind of most, um, most pinning services today kind of match the, 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 the cost bands and the latency bands um, of that because that, that ends up being kind of like the, the sweet spot of what most cloud storage um, is doing right, so it's so kind of the green box here um, uh, that says pending services. That's roughly kind of like where most cloud storage uh, sits. So things like S3, um, Google Cl uh, Cloud Objects, um, and uh, and so on. Uh, the and and then you can see kind of like a CDN. Um, uh, so cl I map CloudFront CloudFront here, which is which is also AWS's. And and of course everything would like to be as cheap as possible and as fast as possible, right? So there's some kind of 
magical ideal that that we can't quite reach, but where where everything is kind of trying to go, and and everything is sort of a trade off. You can you can either spend more money and um, potentially go faster, or or you can you can try to have a, a more cost effective service and and go slower. Um, and of course, as as advances in technology happen, we can kind of chip away at this at this kind of frontier and get closer and closer to the ideal. Um, uh, and so the what I wanted to represent here is is uh, this interesting overlap that that uh, that, that, that I realized a few a few weeks ago, which is that uh, currently uh, pinning services are are perfectly positioned to be about the best retrieval miners in the Falcon network. Um, and so what retrieval miners are are this this kind of class of uh, of service where um, uh, the the main role is to keep content really. Uh, uh, kind of hot, meaning able to be retrieved very quickly, um, where kind of latency really, really matters, but not that much content. So think of, you know, in the orders of um, of a few terabytes, um, which is roughly around the size of what most spending services uh, are doing. Uh, and so that's, uh, and so for, for a lot of the Falcon use cases, we're, we're going to be storing petabytes and petabytes of stuff. We, we can't keep all of that 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 hot. And then there, and there's a kind of a weird reason why um, storage miners here in in this graph in that are kind of shown in in, in blue um, actually can't retrieve faster. Like, what? Why do storage miners take so long to to retrieve? Um, and that's a that's a feature of the of the proofs that we're using, um, where just it falls out of the cryptography where uh, there's a very expensive operation to to uh, do on top of the data to make sure that that parties do have it. Um, and if you want to be able to get the data, you have to de effectively decrypt it out, and that takes some time. Um, as advances in the proofs uh, happen, storage miners are going to be able to inch, uh, you know, further and further left, uh, still with, with around the same kind of cost, costs um, uh, that they have, uh, but ideally being able to, to, um, to, to provide a, a, a much faster service uh, once those, those kinds of proofs uh, are in place. But at least for the beginning of the network and probably for the next six to 12 months, um, really fast delivery is going to be done through retrieval miners, of which I think the the IPFS spinning services are like the best position group to be to just come basically like um, own most of that service uh, because if it, because the the, uh, the it's the right amount of, of data is like the right size of data and the right speed um, and, and so one of the, the things to to think about is is uh, it's also kind of where we expect these things to move over time so um, of course this is kind of super speculative um, it's not not clear at all. Um, but it's likely that with with significant cost reductions in in the proofs that we're that we're doing or the um, or, or the speeds, it's likely that storage miners could actually be serving things out in in hundreds of milliseconds and subsecond. Um, maybe maybe they won't get to like the massive cost reductions that, that we hoped for, um, but it but it is possible. Um, and so we we we're going to see kind of storage miners inching inching towards the left uh, over the over the um, coming years. Uh, at the same time, retrieval miners, uh, we want retrieval miners to be um, moving towards uh, closer and closer to the user to reach certain certain um, capabilities that, that modern CDNs don't have. So modern CDNs kind of stop at the at the ISP level, um, but it's likely that retrieval miners with Falcon can be, you know, other people, you know, your neighbors in, in uh, storing uh, uh, data and serving it to you very quickly from um, either the next house over or potentially a different apartment building um, or a different apartment in the same building. And so that kind of edge level of, um, of delivery isn't really, doesn't really exist yet. Um, and so we hope that over the next few years, we can, um, you know, ne next few months to, to maybe a couple of years, uh, we can build that out and, and we can see like truly a CDN that reaches all the way uh, as close to the user. So we kind of expect both of these groups to start inching left. At some point there's this transition where it is actually going to be cheap enough for pinning services to be storage miners. So right now, I, I say cheap enough because um, being a, a really good storage miner in Falcon today, um, kind of like the sweet spot, sweet spot economically, uh, you want to basically have petabytes of storage and kind of this expensive ceiling, ceiling equipment. And, and that's just not what pinning services do right now. That's a totally different business. But, but as we improve the proofs and a storage miner is kind of inch all the way to the left, it's likely that pinning services could then Drop into being being storage miners directly. So it's kind of like an interesting interesting feature that 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 fell out of of where kind of pinning services are now and where we expect these these um these these groups to go. Of course, this is extremely difficult to do. The lines are Amazon, 
and Amazon is one of the, the strongest organizations to being able to optimize things. So a lot of this is still like we'll see what happens. Um, but kind of the big the big uh, uh, thesis of Falcon is that a market can operate much better than 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 a centrally planned um, centrally planned economy. And so we'll see if the Falcon miners are able to get the same kind of cost reductions that say Bitcoin miners got with with all of the hardware uh, installations that they 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 built. Uh, great. So the, this is kind of another way of visualizing some of the same data, which is um, on the left is sort of the, the diagram that Google Cloud uses to, to describe its kind of uh, core data centers and then like the edge caching and so on. And you can think of, think of that as like the, the storage miners at the center and then kind of the ritual miners at the edges. Um, kind of very well geogra geographically distributed and with low latency delivery to, to the user. Um, so, so, uh, I think that right now th there is a, a, a kind of significant economic opportunity for for um, for uh, pinning services that go into into retrieval, retrieval mining and then end up building a service where really fast um, delivery of the content on the on on um, and this is basically just CIDs right so this is CIDs on, on IPFS which is exactly what what uh, what retrieval um, sorry, what, what pinning services are doing today, um, but it just tweaks what data you store. So instead of storing data, instead of having an agreement with a user long term and storing their data and serving it out um, only, uh, it's it's more about understanding what the network is trying to retrieve at this point in time, fetching that and and redistributing that. So it's kind of a it's like tweak, but it's it's right in the in the sweet spot of of the of the architecture that you currently have. All right, um, I'm gonna stop there, and uh, hopefully this this talk has given given a lot of um, given you a lot of ideas. Uh, we ran a bit over time, but I'm gonna make it up in the in the pinning API talk uh, next up. Thank you.